Hi, I'm Glenn Anderson with the Olympia Fellowship of Reconciliation. This TV series explores a variety of issues that relate to peace, social justice, and nonviolent social change. This month we'll catch up on what's been happening in Palestine, especially in the Gaza area that's northeast of Egypt. We'll learn about the exciting project for a mural that celebrates the relationship between Olympia and Rafa, a city in Gaza. Uh, we have two guests who will share their knowledge, their firsthand experiences, their compassion, their insights, and their information about the mural project. I'm happy to welcome Cindy Corey and Rochelle Goss. Good to have Hi. you both here. Uh, Cindy Corey developed a strong interest in that part of the world when her daughter Rachel Corey went to Rafa as part of the International Solidarity Movement. And that's a nonprofit group that connects people from all over the world with, uh, with the, the uh, Palestinian areas to give people firsthand experience about the realities and then to communicate those realities to the rest of the world. After Israeli military bulldozers killed Rachel, Cindy and Craig Corey increased their own evol involvement in working for peace and justice and human rights in that part of the world. So it's good to have you here, Cindy. Thank you very much. Uh, Rochelle Goss has worked on a lot of different activities that promote peace, social justice, organizing with youth, young people, uh, helping low-income people grow food in gardens, and just lots of other things to help make our community a better place to live. Uh, for two months, uh, Rochelle lived in Rafa, Palestine, and currently she serves as Project Development Specialist for the Rachel Corey Foundation for Peace and Justice. Uh, good to have you here, Rochelle. Thank you, Glenn. Well, this is an, a part of the world that we're talking about that a lot of people are just so confused about. And I wonder if we can start out with just some very basic information about the history of, uh, say, the late 1940s to now in like a minute. <laughs> so like a one minute overview. I can say when I first got involved um, with this issue and my own education understanding about it, I think one of the most important things for me was to realize that the, the myth that I had heard so much about this being a thousand-year-old conflict, a uh, religious-based conflict, wasn't true. And um, through my studies of it, I've come to realize that it's really a conflict over land. And, um, and through my travels there, that becomes really, it became really um, clear. Um, with uh, the atrocities of the Holocaust, Zionism, which was the notion of creating a Jewish state, uh, really took root. And Palestine, that area, was selected um, for, for that state. And the problem with that is that there was already a population living there. And so the, the conflict really arises out of having two people in one, one land. And there's different ways that that could play out. There's, uh, one government with uh, you know democratic representation of both people there would be the possibility of two separating it into two and two states and having two separate governments or the reality that we have today which is uh, when one of those um, people uh, uh, um, controls the entire area and the other one lives with uh, under military occupation which is the situation happening now mm -hmm. today um, the, um, uh, the occupation that you mentioned, the military occupation, uh, has been a reality since a long time now. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been decades, and we'll talk some more about the realities, the day-to-day -day realities in people's lives in, uh, later on in the program. Right now, could, could either of you talk about what some of those realities are for people who, the Palestinian people who are living under the occupation of another nation in their own land. The occupation, uh, we're heading toward the 41st anniversary of this occupation. Um, after, in 1947, uh, it, through the UN, uh, there, there was an attempt to create at that time two states, Israel and Palestine, but with a very a, a disproportionate part of the land going for the state, what was to be the state of Israel. and. Um, the, the indigenous population on the land, because they were much more populous, didn't agree with that. So war broke out. And until 1967, the borders were formed by the results of that war. We had the West Bank, uh, which is bordered by the Jordan River in the West, that um, 
was under the control of Jordan. And then the Gaza Strip, which is what we're going to be talking about, mm -hmm. I think, a lot tonight, which was under the control of Egypt. But in 67, um, uh, there was war. Uh, Israel took control of the West Bank and Gaza and some other land as mm -hmm. well. But ultimately, where we are today is that uh, the country of Israel is occupying the West Bank and mm -hmm. Gaza. Um, Rochelle and I both spent time there. Uh, I, I think that the whole concept of occupation is the hardest part of this for Americans mm -hmm. to wrap our heads around. Mm -hmm. um, in the in the news, you know, we get we hear about violence coming from both sides, some mm -hmm. from Israeli military. Uh, we hear about Palestinian violence against Israeli civilians mm -hmm. and is, Israeli military violence against Palestinian civilians. Mm -hmm. So we we hear about the violence, but what we don't and have an understanding at all, I think, about is the day-to-day -day experience of Palestinians who for now 41 years have lived under this occupation. I think we have a better idea because of Iraq, maybe, a little bit, mm -hmm. when we see how the Iraqi population has yeah. responded to us yeah. being there. Yeah, imagine if we're there 41 years later, right. uh, it may be that uh, the people would be more upset than at present. Right. Um, can you tell us something about what, what your daughter Rachel was doing there? She went there in the winter of uh, tail end of two, 2003. 2002, yeah. very beginning of 2003. Right. And so tell us what, what she was doing there. Uh, Rachel went in January of 2003. Mm -hmm. She went to be a part of or to join the International Solidarity Movement, which is a Palestinian-led uh, movement. It was actually founded by a um, Palestinian professor. We've met all the co-founders, mm -hmm. uh, Ghassan Andoni, Ghassan Andoni, who's a professor at Birzeit University in the West Bank, Netta Golden, who's an Israeli, still working with ISM, uh, Adam Shapiro, an American, Jewish American, uh, who was from Brooklyn and had worked in Israel and Palestine for a long time with Seeds of Peace, and his wife, Huweda Arif, who's Palestinian-American mm -hmm. and has family ties in the area. Um, and they founded this nonviolent um, support for Palestinian nonviolent resistance because in 2002, um, in the United Nations, there was a resolution uh, to bring a peacekeeping force into the area after the beginning of the Second Intifada. And that uh, resolution was vetoed by the United States and by Israel. And so then ISM was formed. Friends of Rachel's went in 2002. Mm -hmm. She heard about what they were doing, what they were seeing and witnessing. They came back here to Olympia to talk about that. Rachel was very curious about what was happening in the Middle East, uh, particularly after 9-11, and mm -hmm. of course connected with the peace movement here. Okay. When she went there, um, she wanted to go to Gaza. She chose very specifically to go there because she felt it was the most isolated, the most ignored part, the most uh, yeah. desolate part of the occupied territories. Her work, some people say, you know, uh, they talk about her being a human shield and, and they know about her standing to protect a house and being uh -huh. killed by a, a caterpillar D9R bulldozer. But she also went to connect with the women and the children uh -huh. and the families. Um, Craig and I visited the Children's Parliament where, where children work on democracy, on, on having debates about what's happening in their lives. They had a trial about Bush and Sharon. Rachel was a part of that. She worked with them on it. Uh, what they found was not that something terrible really should happen to Bush and Sharon, but that they should be tried in the International Court of, uh -huh. of Justice. Uh -huh. um, Rachel uh, went to the Women's Center, uh, General Union of Palestinian Women, on uh, International Women's Day to connect with uh -huh. the women there. Uh, she wrote a beautiful letter to a young Palestinian woman named Nyla. Uh, who shared that letter with us when we were there. It was mm -hmm. a letter of encouragement to a teenager about mm -hmm. all that was could could be possible mm -hmm. in her life, all the good yeah. she could bring to the world. So yeah. that's a little of what yeah. she was doing. She really, you know, when you, when you think about what she was doing there, it was really the very best elements of solidarity. Yes. Just very supportive, very humane, very much uh, one with the humanity of connecting with the others. And right. There's this great, great work she was doing there. Um, after 2003, the relationship that had already existed to some extent between Olympia and Rafa from the predecessors, from Rachel's predecessors who went there with uh, ISM, uh, grew. Can you tell us something about what's happened with the relationship between Olympia and Rafa since 2003? 
Well, uh, kind, Rich, kind of briefly. Rochelle is, is <laughs> very connected to that story, too, because a dream of Rachel's had been to establish a sister city project. She talked about that. Part of in her witnessing, she wrote back to people here about what she was seeing and the emails. Um, most people know about those now. Many do mm -hmm. in our community. But her dream was to uh, build this connection. She had met with Jean Eberhardt, who mm -hmm. had established the um, Santa Tomas right. uh, County uh, relationship with us here in Thurston County in, from Nicaragua. And Jean was kind of a mentor about how do you do this, yeah. you know, with this place that is so isolated and so far from us. When Rachel was killed, this, this wonderful, amazing thing happened here in Olympia where people gathered together, of course, to deal with what had happened to Rachel, but also to think about what they could do, what the next steps could do, mm -hmm. be. And one was to establish the Olympia Rafa Sister City Project. Mm -hmm. It was an amazing amount of energy uh -huh. and effort that went into yeah. that, that Ra Rochelle might and like to comment. And with the Iraq War starting, you know, just two days afterwards, too, I remember the first OM Olympia Movement for Justice and Peace meeting uh -huh. that I went to afterwards. There were 200, over 200 people there, yeah. um, you know, in response to both Rachel's death and to the war. And out of that, a subcommittee started uh, and discussion of mm -hmm. trying to carry on this vision that she had had. And, uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, and and shortly after, uh, Emma went. I don't remember exactly how long, but someone from Olympia went yeah. back to. and and we had Emma uh, as a guest in our program uh, on the, on yeah. this topic, mm -hmm. uh, sometime soon after she had returned here. Uh, well, as hard as it is uh, to get into Gaza, as difficult and challenging as it is to make those journeys, there has been a fairly steady stream yeah. of people from Olympia that have gone because of the Olympia Rafa Sister right. City Project, because of how this community, maybe more than most others around the world, have come to know about uh, this place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, just one day before we're taping the program, John Harvey returned after mm -hmm. having spent some time yeah. there, mm -hmm. and uh, he's a, a great great person in this community, very sweet and mm -hmm. articulate and knowledgeable and compassionate. And, mm -hmm. uh, hope to have him as a guest on the program sometime great. Uh, as well. Um, the Rachel Corey Foundation for Peace and Justice was created to carry on uh, some of her vision and, and activities. Uh, can you tell us something briefly? We'll talk more in, later yeah. on in the program about yes. it, but just right now, just a little yeah. sense of what that foundation yep. is about. It really started because people were coming to us asking us what they could do um, and uh, wanted to support something. Uh, there, were, there were different ways that people did that, but we had the experience of meeting Linda Beal soon after Rachel was killed, a couple weeks after. Linda Beal's daughter Amy was killed in South Africa when the oh, yeah. uh, voters were being, all voters were being registered for the first election in which yeah. everyone could vote. And when Linda was coming to Seattle, she made it known that she'd be willing to talk with us. This was about two or three weeks after Rachel was killed. We sat down with her and I remember looking at her and asking her uh, a question, whether she was ever able to really reclaim any part of her previous life after her daughter had been killed in a very violent way. And she thought for a minute and looked at me and she said, not really. And I, our family, of course, was was thinking about the directions that our lives would now take, the directions that they should take. Uh, the Beals had started a foundation, and in fact, a remarkable thing about that is that there were four people convicted of, of uh, Amy's killing. Some of them participated in the truth and reconciliation process. Oh. And at, at least one I've seen on TV speaking with Linda Beale, so someone who was responsible for her daughter's uh, murder now working in the foundation in South Africa that oh. they have so that was great inspiration and yeah. that, though that's really uh, where the foundation originated uh -huh. our work uh, very briefly centers around kind of four uh, areas making connections education supporting grassroots activism and using art and the written word to encourage peace and justice in yeah. the world because that, those were all things important to right. Rachel. And you and other people right. in the community helped us to define what the foundation should uh, be. And we'll talk some more about that. We should let the viewers know that they can reach these through their websites. Um, the uh, Rachel Corey Foundation for Peace and Justice is at www.racheltcoreyfoundation.org and they have a phone in Olympia and an office. Yes. Uh, <laughs> at, uh, 754-3998 and then the Olympia Rafa 
Sister City Project website is www.orscp.org, mm -hmm. and we'll have these. Uh, we'll bring those up on the screen uh, later on in the program, and we'll have them at the end as, as well, because uh, they're both great resources to connect with. Um, we're focusing much of this program about the the uh, mural project, mm -hmm. the uh, Olympia Rafa mural project. Um, the uh, and both of you are working very hard on that. Uh, the, uh, well, t tell us something about it. About the mural project? Yeah, yeah, tell us. Uh, so um, it's such an exciting process and a lot of people have been involved in it. I think Cindy will talk a little bit about the origins and um, the artist, uh, there's an amazing mural artist, uh, Susan Green, in, who lives in the Bay Area, who actually kind of initiated it. Um, but now uh, we've been having a whole bunch of events in the community and just getting people you know, involved and excited about it. Mm -hmm. And um, it's going to be on the side of the Labor Temple building. Um, and so it's they, right downtown. Yeah, Olympia. right downtown. Mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, you think of, you know, what, what the movement for peace and justice and human rights uh, in a better world need to be doing and nonviolently. And this is certainly a, a re really clever, nonviolent, uh, human connecting kind of thing and it's like yeah here, here's a great model for what's going on um, the the people who are planning the mural project have developed a list of goals you have 13 goals for the project mm -hmm. and I wonder if you could just mention a couple of the highlights a couple of things that that you especially resonate with totally um, some of them uh, we will strengthen the ties between the Olympia and Rafa communities as we engage those in Rafa in the project and work to bring Rafa artists to participate in creating the mural. So one of our efforts right now is to bring uh, two artists who, while I was living in uh, Rafa, I got to know and did some work with them. Uh, and so we're working to try to bring them to participate in the painting of the mural, which will be amazing. Um, we will welcome and honor those in our community whose hidden histories include oppression and struggles for human rights and will invite expressions of their stories within the mural. Although the intention of the mural is to draw these connections we have already with Rafa, um, there's so many incredible you know, histories just here in Olympia. So we want to not only have this mural draw that connection, but also to celebrate the history we have here and mm -hmm. recognize those struggles. Um, maybe just to mention one other. Um, we will engage our community in learning about and celebrating the Olympia Rafa Sister City relationship and will produce a people's recognition of it. So. Okay. Yeah, so they're, they have is, is very, very well thought through it's, mm -hmm. and very encouraging. And then the, 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 the uh, people planning the, the mural have developed five principles to guide the work. And could any, uh, mm -hmm. they, they've thought through even just the process of designing and producing the mural <laughs> right. needs to have some principles and some thoughtfulness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So can you just mention like one or two of those, of those uh, sure. pretty, pretty briefly. Yeah, uh, we believe that murals can bring people together and can be good organizing tools. Uh, the process of creating the mural can be a community building opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we believe that the mural we design and create should be one that we are all proud of and that becomes an Olympia landmark. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the beginning. How, how, what are the origins of this? Rochelle mentioned Susan Green, who's with Break the Silence Murals in the Bay Area. And in 1989, Susan and uh, I believe three other Jewish American women who were artists traveled to the West Bank to do collaborative community art with West Bank communities and, and created murals there. And, Su and Susan is a wonderful advocate for um, the power of art uh, to to make a difference. I mean, to connect people. I mm -hmm. think uh, to pr help people process um, the experiences that they're having in their lives uh, in this very, of course, nonviolent way, but mm -hmm. creative way. And I think reaching uh, people's, um, you know, reaching uh, people their expression of it in places that we don't sometimes do if mm -hmm. we just sit down and have a conversation about what's going on or hear a lecture. Mm -hmm. 
um, but you kind of deep, dig very deeply into your soul when you're creating art together, I think. At least that's been our experience so far. Um, and Susan and these uh, women then returned uh, to the United States. They talked about their experiences doing the murals. They created a film. Um, they continued to go back. She's gone back before, and she's done mural art also in other places like Nicaragua and in the Bay Area. She's yeah. very well known for it. She's a wonderful mentor to us, and she's been very generous with her time. She came to Olympia. Um, well, uh, the story really goes back to when Craig and I went to the Bay Area in, in 2004. Um, we've been tremendously supported by people all over the world and all over the country and in the Bay Area particularly. We spoke in Berkeley, and Susan heard us tell the story of Rachel and of our lives at that time. And she told me that she immediately knew where she wanted to go for the next mural was to Ruffa. Uh -huh. And so she, she was very persistent and because we were hard to reach at that time. Mm -hmm. um, but she just kept emailing and made connections in different ways, told us about this dream of hers. Mm -hmm. And she wanted to work with the people of Ruffa to create the mural, but also wanted to have some um, input from people in in Rachel's family and the community. So she talked to us about Rachel's words, mm -hmm. um, things that mattered to people in Olympia, like the salmon, wanted mm -hmm. to think about images that might go from there to, to Rafa. Mm -hmm. In 2004, she couldn't get to Rafa. Uh, she got into northern Gaza, was not able to get uh, make the 30-mile trip south because of the checkpoints and what was happening internally at the time. Uh, she returned in 2005, though, with an, another group of artists from the U.S., and they went to Rafa and worked with people that were friends of Rachel's there and created these mural images on the Rachel Corey Children and Youth Cultural Center. Mm -hmm. um, subsequently, Craig and I have been able to go back and see some of those images, Rochelle as well. Um, sadly, there was some damage to them because because I think because of the quick amount of time she had to be there, I think it was maybe four or five days at the most that they had to work mm -hmm. all these, you know, it's very difficult getting yeah. in there and being able to stay. Uh, but they, so things like just the application of the paint and the materials that they had and so forth were different than what if you were doing it in the U.S. Right. So she, and Susan's eager to go back because she tells me she cares a lot about her murals and wants to make sure, you know, that uh -huh. they're repaired and so forth. That's how it started. Um, then she um, persisted again, wanted to come to Olympia. The idea of a mural here happened and people from Rafa being connected to that process. She came in 2006 and did these amazing workshops that were, uh, she started, did it at the Olympia Center. People there were so impressed. There was a, a, some people from the mosque in Lacey who then saw it and said, will you come and talk to us about it? And they did. So she wow. got to, or Susan did. And so she shared all this. She was back again this year. Um, with our events in January and participated for a whole day with mm -hmm. mural artists mm -hmm. in our community, over 25 who came to start this process mm -hmm. of creating the design for our mural. So tell us about the, the design process. Is it? Yeah, so this workshop that Cindy just mentioned was in January. Late, and, late January. Yeah, and there's been uh, involvement for months prior to that too, but this is when I really felt like the design piece took off, and um, and they're ongoing. There's another one. Uh, there will be one in March, um, as well, and then continue throughout the process. Yeah. Well, what's yeah. what's the March? Day? Some people who are watching the program, if they're seeing this early in March, uh -huh. might still be able to catch it. Uh -huh. It's March 8th. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. At yeah. the Olympia Center. Okay. Mm -hmm. Three or it's in the afternoon. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so the but the the design process is 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 very participatory. You're really reaching out. Well, including from the the principles, the goals that you mentioned. You know, mm -hmm. it's very inclusive and yeah. community based. We'll talk some more about that later on in the program. But okay. just in studying up on it to prepare for the show, I was so much impressed by the Great. thought and the care and the compassion and the sense of community that's gone into it. That's mm -hmm. um, very interesting. Um, what what are the next steps? What's the timeline? You Planning, planning to have it done by sometime in the fall of 2008. Right. And you've got, um, uh, oh, there's one to four o'clock on, on, on the, the eight. eight. Is oh, the, okay, I got it. It's in the <laughs> <Thank> notes. <you. laughs> At the Olympia Center. Yeah. Um, and um, 
they, they were, it, they're going to do some work on, on some tiles, Arch Walk weekend in late April. That's, uh, that's one aspect of it. Um, what Rochelle, Rochelle said about the process, you know, evolving, there's been all this wonderful input that started um, way back in 2007, January, when Susan was here, of people just um, talking about their ideas for the mural um, in words mm -hmm. and then started the the um, peop, we urged people to send drawings and images and so we've been collecting these mm -hmm. ideas now for uh, you know a year and a half mm -hmm. or so almost mm -hmm. um, and that process just keeps continuing the artists now um, are are uh, working to come up with a rendition that will for the wall and they're they're working with susan green over the telephone uh, almost uh, sometimes a couple meetings a week uh, mm -hmm. that we have in planning for all of this using um, a lot of internet technologies now which yeah. is amazing for scanning you know designs both the artists in san francisco and here mm -hmm. and yeah. discussing it and and they hope to have a rendition for uh, arts walk ideally uh, yeah. that they'll be uh, the beginning the mm -hmm. beginning kind of a draft vision and you have a special event coming up on uh, Sunday, March 16, that you can tell us about. Right. Um, that is the fifth anniversary of Rachel's killing uh, in Gaza. But we've we view it. Um, it's a it's a kind of a it's a hard day for our family in some ways. Um, and so we ha we often don't initiate things, but others around us have. And um, and I've I've kind of come to see it as a day to remember the stand that. Rachel took for, for justice. And um, we view it as a day for education, uh, for connecting, for building community, for gathering together, and for thinking about ways that we can take action. Um, that particular day is going to be amazing. I think there's an event planned at the Olympia Ballroom from 3 to 6 p.m. Uh, there will be three speakers and time for discussion and music and some food and so forth. But the speakers are Adrian Niangabo, who is a Quaker from Burundi. And he, um, our, our Quaker friends in the community um, were the ones who initiated this year's activities around this, really, and had met with Adrian before. Um, he is, his father, I believe, was um, Hutu, his mother, Tutsi. He was nearly killed because he yeah. represented both yeah. sides. But he survived and has now gone on to do this amazing uh, reconciliation work. Yeah. So he's kind of an example of, of what hopefully, you know, someday uh, we're a long way from a uh, reconciliation process in the, with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, but, but his is an example of where you, you would yeah. hope um, and people are doing, planting seeds for that kind of work in Israel-Palestine all the time, too. Yeah. One of the other speakers, uh, Jen Marlowe, who's a very good friend of ours that we met in Jerusalem in 2003 in the old city, a uh, Jewish-American who had worked with Seeds of Peace for a number of years. Um, she's become a close friend here. She had Seattle connections before. Uh, she will be speaking as well about her experience in Israel-Palestine. She was just there again and also in Gaza. So she'll be able to share about that. But she also has spent time in Africa. She went to Darfur. Has, uh, some people here know about her film about Darfur and a book that she and others, she collaborated with some others in writing. She recently went to South Sudan, uh, took back in, in doing the book on Darfur. She met um, some of the lost boys of Sudan mm -hmm. and uh, who helped with translation. She went back with them to see if they could find their homes. Mm -hmm. And so she's now creating a um, film about that experience. So Jen will be somebody who can kind of right. uh, move between these two areas yeah. that day. And Steve Niva, who is a professor at the Evergreen State College, I know he's been and here. And a frequent guest on this program. Yeah. He's so knowledgeable and articulate. He, absolutely. And mm -hmm. Steve has been talking to me in the last month or two and saying it's time for another 
um, a, a talk with the community about what's going on right now yeah. in Israel and Palestine. Yeah. So I feel we'll be bringing all those components together in that event. Uh, Craig and I won't be there that afternoon. So this is going to be the community's event. We'll be there in spirit. We might phone in, but we're going to be in Israel, Palestine ourselves. So, okay. uh, but it's going to be a great afternoon for people to get together. Okay. I'm going to ask Rochelle about something. You might want to make sure the microphone is aimed properly. Okay, thanks. Just adjust that. I want to check with Rochelle uh, about what some of the current realities are about the occupation. We earlier in the show mentioned something about the, the, the notion of the occupation. I want to get into some of the specifics and make sure that the viewers will understand the, the realities. Mm -hmm. uh, what else should people know about what's going on? Well, um if I can show this. Yes, map, we maybe. should show actually the yeah, part that we're talking about. Right. Um, this is the eastern end of the Mediterranean Sea. Mm -hmm. It's a very close close up. Mm -hmm. Most of Israel would be to the right and going up from the upper right corner. Mm -hmm. Israel, or uh, yes, Israel, uh, that's the Gaza Strip there. Mm -hmm. And then to the lower left corner is where Egypt starts, and that runs off to the west and to the south. So it's a, it's a very close up. And, you told us before the show how small that space is. Right. Yeah, from top to bottom, it's about 27 miles, uh, Gaza Strip. And the width is about, uh, on average, around six or seven miles. And there's one and a half million people that live on this small piece of land. Yeah. So it's one of the most densely populated pieces of land uh, and then, on the and then earth. Rafa is In right the down there on the edge, right up against the Egyptian border. There, right there. So that's what we're talking mm -hmm. about. So it's mm -hmm. a very small space mm -hmm. and um, but the reality is of occupation I could talk a little bit about it yes looking at this picture too that all three sides here uh, are surrounded by a wall uh, and there's only one uh, there's actually two but one entrance and exit into Israel that's um, allowed and most Palestinians are unable uh, to to pass through to get visas to leave yeah. uh, Gaza so um, when I was there in late 2005, early 2006, um, the, the situation was definitely, it felt very much like it was worsening. And today, there's very much a siege on, on Gaza. Uh, when we s spoke to people, I was there with another Olympian, uh, Serena, she, we, people would describe it as living in an open air prison. And I think that's very much the reality. Um, everything that comes in and out of there in terms of supplies, is, uh, completely controlled by Israel, um, and oftentimes even basic needs uh, are prevented from from mm -hmm. getting in. Um, you, you have a list of a few items. I mean, there there are only a few items. You have you told me on the phone when we were preparing for the show that mm -hmm. there are farmers who will grow a crop and then they're not allowed to bring it out to, right. to take the crop to market. Right, because and uh, it, it's just so severely uh, cut. Mm -hmm. So the uh, yeah some of the like currently right now um, there are only 20 items that Israel is allowing uh, to enter Gaza um, and just to give you how specific they are uh, diapers toilet paper sugar salt flour um, frozen meat not fresh meat uh, fruits and vegetables um, but less than what's needed uh, we've heard from um, Jen who was there recently uh, soap but not laundry detergent, not shampoo. Um, so, so for some reason, the government of Israel is militarily preventing people from having laundry detergent, uh, shampoo, fresh chocolate, meat. Chocolate, chocolate is something we hear. Uh, our uh, friends who have been able but, to go. But how, how bizarre and arbitrary. Mm -hmm. And so when you talk about oppression mm -hmm. and the checkpoints where people aren't allowed to come or go, mm -hmm. the open air prison sounds like a, an apt mm -hmm. description. Sure. Um, and even the side where the sea is is, is uh, patrolled 24 hours and uh, fishermen who traditionally you know would get a lot of their food sources there are only mm -hmm. allowed to go out a short distance from the shore uh, and there's been cases while I was there there was uh, two fishermen who were killed um, by a missile uh, while they were fishing out on the sea because mm -hmm. they had strayed too far. You and other people have used the term collective punishment. Yes. Tell us about that, the, 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 mm -hmm. the notion of collective, collective punishment and how punishment. it pertains. Um, well, to some extent, 
Um, you know, this punishment of Gaza has been going on for a very long time, but it's been dramatically escalated since 2006. We had d disengagement from Gaza, if you remember, in September of 2005. There were settlements in Gaza, down where Rachel was, near Rafa. She Isra felt Isra sad. Isra Israeli, Israeli settlements. So the government has, has built uh, yeah. neighborhoods in occupied territory right. on other people's land. And it actually ended up taking, I, I've seen the figure, approximately 40% of the land. It's a very large amount. Craig and I had the experience of being down there when those settlements were there and then going back after they were gone. And it was kind of shocking to me to be able to, when we could drive along the seacoast, to see how much land it was. But there were 8,000, approximately 8,000 settlers who lived in those settlements, about, I think, 21 or 22 settlements throughout Gaza. They were... Um, uh, they did leave, or were forced to leave in 2005, um, largely, I think, to take uh, attention away from what was happening in the West Bank, because the world looked at it as, oh, this great thing that Israel was doing. Yeah, yeah it was a PR game. Yeah. Public relations And game. it was good in a way that they were going because it, it, it did open up. When we went back, you could go from the north end of Gaza to the south end without checkpoints. When Rachel was there, she talked about how the area was divided in three sections by checkpoints that, that created all sorts of travel problems for the people there. Um, so, but anyway, you had disengagement. There was some hope among the Palestinian people there that things would get better for them. There, were some, there was talk with Condoleezza Rice and James Wolfenson who had, was sent in about buses being able to go from Gaza to the West Bank. That never materialized. The minute there was any kind of violence at all that came from Palestinians towards uh, the Israeli side, then sort of all discussion of any progress for the Palestinian people there stopped, and they, they're just, there's this clamp yeah. on them. When uh, Hamas was elected at the beginning of 2006, it got even tighter. Yeah. And then when Hamas overthrew um, Fatah, which happened uh, last year, uh, the noose went about as tight as it's ever been, yeah. I think, and it's only gotten worse and worse. But what's happened, and we do, uh, people know about Qasem rockets being fired from uh, northern Gaza particularly into Israeli cities that are near that area. And um, it does target civilians, Israeli civilians. They do. They haven't been tremendously successful, but I think I heard this morning that 14 Israelis have died from those in the last seven years. But in response to that, the Israeli response has been um, often uh, uh, air attacks, huge attacks, all kinds of uh, uh, collective punishment. Mm -hmm. This is what we're seeing with not being able to have medicines going in, cutting electrical mm -hmm. supplies, uh, all the food things that Rochelle talked about. That is collective punishment against right. one and a half million people, which is in, it's illegal under international yeah, law. Yeah, yeah. So what happens uh, to... to help bring that sense home. Yeah. Suppose there is somebody in in your neighborhood mm -hmm. who was doing some bad things and the response was to to shell your entire neighborhood right. to prevent anybody in your neighborhood from getting access to food or fuel or medical care or whatever because and you know I mean that you that's you just can't do that. That's not fair. That's not legal yeah. under international law and that's what they're doing is they're punishing an entire population for what a few individuals do, um, and the it's it's uh, I read uh, just lately here that uh, the, you know they need fuel to run the sewage treatment plants, right. and without the fuel to to run the motors to pump sewage, uh, sewage just backs up in the street. So it's like what the United States has done to to Iraq and Baghdad in particular, and Israel is doing that to Palestine, which is just a gross. It's basically it's chemical or it's biological warfare because we're using the microorganisms in sewage as a way to poison the people, which is illegal under international law, but nobody seems to care. I, I think it'll be fascinating to hear from our friend John Harvey about what yeah. he saw and experienced there. I, I, I can say from firsthand, I mean, even before all of this, um, the conditions there are unbelievable for Americans. And yeah. when I went, it was a sea of rubble because of 
home demolitions. But um, but I think the thing about this is, uh, and Steve Niva, I hope we'll have people will come to hear from him because um, what's prompting all this and the motivations behind it is the kind of analysis that he can provide. Because it's the thing I think that's most troubling to me is that it's completely counter to, I think, any logical thought that applying this t to people, this kind of punishment to people, yeah. is somehow going to um, create yeah. a, 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 a security yeah. or right. a solution. Right. Huh? You, can't, yeah. you can't become secure by antagonizing people. And we, in our government, we pay lip service to democracy. And then if, if another country votes a way we don't like, we punish the people for voting in a way that the Bush regime doesn't like, you know, right. it's like that's, that's, you know, yeah. if you value democracy, you value democracy. Mm -hmm. I know too that I just saw an Israeli poll, over a majority of the Israeli people believe that what's happening with Gaza should be stopped, that the siege uh -huh. should be stopped, that it's not effective, it's yeah. not working. Yeah. We're <coughs> running tight on time, but I want to, uh, you have, do a couple things kind of quickly. You have photos uh, of you with uh, uh, a family, you were sitting mm -hmm. on the floor, and uh, it's hard to, hard to spot you in the photo because you, <laughs> uh, you covered your head. Your covered, head. So, yes. uh -huh. uh, it's you and Serena. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, and this is with the Nasrallah family, which is the family whose home Rachel died defending. Yeah. Um, we stayed with them so for be, it, several it, weeks. It's, uh -huh. well, the, the, all of the exchange program, programs that you folks are doing is, mm -hmm. is very people to people. It's mm -hmm. very. Uh, uh, it, 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 it's humane. It's not just an abstract them. Right. But there, there's the family. Right. You know. Right. And uh, so it was just good to, to be able to see that. Um, um, you told me on the phone when we were preparing for the program that you learned to, to sleep while bombing was going on, mm -hmm. and um, it's just it's just amazing. And then Cindy, you sent me a quotation from uh, Jeff Halper, who's with. Yeah. Uh, he works with the Israeli Committee Against House Demolition. He's uh, a Jewish uh, person in Israel. He's an Israeli right. Jew. Mm -hmm. um, and he, I just want to read his quote because I thought it was powerful. The house demolitions, of course, they're bulldozing down the homes of Palestinian people because Israel wants that land for settlements or for the wall that they put up and so forth. Mm -hmm. So uh, Jeff Halper, the Israeli Jew who's working with uh, the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions, said, as an Israeli Jew, I have been saddened and mortified that my own people, after all they've experienced, cannot see what they are doing to others. But on a larger scale, not as an Israeli Jew, but as a human being, I take heart in the Palestinians' active refusal to be ground under a global system that is producing unimaginable wealth and power for a few at the expense of growing ranks of the wretched. I'm not a Palestinian. I'm not one of the oppressed. I only hope that I can use my privilege in an effective way in order to redeem the gift the people of Gaza have given all of us, the realization that the, the people do have power and can prevail even in the face of overwhelming power. We may each express our responsibility toward the people of Gaza in whatever way most suits us, but as the privileged, we must do something. We owe the Palestinians and the Palestinians writ large at least that. I thought, what a, what a great, uh, big-hearted and compassionate mm -hmm. statement. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and, and as you said, like with even in, in South Africa or in all kinds of places, there are people who, are, who sometimes will step out of their role, out of the role that's been assigned to them. Mm -hmm. And uh, as Americans, we see people doing that as well. Mm -hmm. right. But uh, there, it's, it's these kinds of changes that are still possible and that give hope, as you've both been... Uh, expressing. And there's uh, so much, if I can just interject, dehumanizing, I think, that happens, you know, especially to Arabs. And when you go yeah. travel to the area and you realize that, you know, everyone's struggling for the same things, for education, for their children, for, you know, their basic needs to be met. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it just, it's uh, so powerful just to make small connections. And yeah. there's so, so many ways in our community to do that. And during the Cold War, uh, people would sometimes go to the Soviet Union and visit there and mm -hmm. and they come back and say, you know what, the Russians like ice cream too, just like we do. <laughs> you know, like the big, big, big yeah. news, and you know they, they love their grandchildren just like we do. You know, it, it, it was this like light bulb goes on that, right. that oh, these are people that our government has targeted as the enemy, the evil mm -hmm. empire, terrorists. So, so very, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. and they just run through this 
a whole series of these over time, and now it's Arabs, it's Muslims, it's mm -hmm. whatever, and who knows what it'll be uh, a mm -hmm. few years now. It could be mm -hmm. some other group. Um, it's, it's Mexicans, mm -hmm. if you, you know, talk to some politicians and some people. Um, we already had connections with Rafa before Rachel went there, um, and then as we've talked about, the relationship uh, grew further. Um, and you mentioned when we were preparing for the program that, that there's fair trade items mm -hmm. coming into Olympia. Tell uh -huh. us about that. And we're running tight on time, so we need to keep yeah, it kind of tight. So there are items um, available. Uh, Dick has been kind enough at Traditions Dick, Dick to, yes, Dick Meyer, yeah. to um, sell many of the items that various people who have gone over there uh, to Rafa have purchased uh, embroidery crafts and whatnot. And so that is often for sale um, at Traditions or at our events. We tend to have it there as well. We've worked with artists, um, some of the artists that we're hoping to bring, and they've done amazing pastels of the their reality um, uh, that we've brought back here and had showings of their art. Um, we've had uh, uh, video conferencing, uh, like where you sit down and, uh, with youth here in Olympia and youth in uh, Rafa to talk about with translation, um, to talk about you know their lives and what's similar and what's different. Mm -hmm. And there's so m the options are endless. I think for drawing mm -hmm. connections between mm -hmm. our communities for sure. Um, Part of what you're doing with the mural, as you both mentioned, is connecting it to other issues that go beyond. Mm -hmm. And I want to see if we can address a few of those mm -hmm. briefly. One mm -hmm. is you have this visual mm -hmm. here, this one. Okay. Yes. It is so compelling. <laughs> um, let's hold it out this way. And then what uh, Aaron Jemia had painted this based on information mm -hmm. that's available, but most people in the country don't see it. Let me just walk us through it real quickly. Sure. Uh, but the left side shows the United States, and the bottom is in 1492. That's how much uh, of the territory that became the United States that the indigenous population had mm -hmm. in 1492. And you can see the, the little red parts that are left in 2007 above it. That's all that's left. Those are the Indian reservations. That's where we put them. Um, and a comparable process is on the right, where you see the the first map of Israel um, is in 1947. The red area shows how much of the territory the uh, Palestinian people had. Uh, the second map of Israel has a much shrunk part that Palestinian people uh, could control. And the 2007 one shows that it's shrunk even further. Mm -hmm. uh, that and so the, these are very fragmented, and just like people who work in biology know, if you have like an endangered species, mm -hmm. and and the habitat is like scattered, you got a little bit here and a little bit there and a little bit there, uh, it's it's a way to make that species mm -hmm. go extinct. And Aaron created this um, for one of our events that we had um, around the mural project, which is in trying to draw connections locally. Uh -huh. You know. Uh, we had a great event where we had um, a professor from Evergreen, whom I'm forgetting his name now. Gary Peterson. Gary Peterson uh -huh. speak, um, and we showed a film about the Nakba and about the dispossession of land. Um, so talking about those yeah. comparisons. But yeah. So you're making that connection with mm -hmm. the Native Americans and how they got pushed off their land and the indigenous people in mm -hmm. Palestine are getting squeezed off theirs. And you've done some other uh, comparisons or some other mm -hmm bigger issues. Tell us about... We had an event um, in November, a few months ago, of uh, drawing connections between the wall in Palestine and the wall that's uh, being constructed now between uh, the U.S. and Mexico. And in fact, the um, contract for the construction of the wall between the, at the south of the U.S. has been given to Boeing and to a company, an Israeli company, that has played a large part in constructing the wall there. Mm -hmm. um, so we had some great speakers that night as well. Yeah. So uh, w interestingly, what, what I've been seeing lately about the wall between the U.S. and Mexico is that when it comes to like uh, a rich people's neighborhood, it, it just stops and mm -hmm. it picks up after that rich people's neighborhood and it stops mm -hmm. uh, right at some uh, very snazzy golf and country club that some rich people own to give to the Republican Party mm -hmm. and then it, the wall resumes afterwards. So it's not really a continuous <laughs> barrier. It's, it's very hit and miss. Mm -hmm. And it depends partly on do you have power or not 
well, and if you don't have power, then the wall goes through your land. And if it, if you do have power, then then you're exempt. And you know. And with the wall in Palestine, right. you know, it very much rather than sticking to the green line, the international uh, border of the West yeah. Bank, it's you know snakes in and out and takes all you know based on resources a lot on water, yeah. but also on the settlements on the Israeli communities right. to take them and make them part of greater yeah. and Israel. I've, I've read that it'll even cut through, and so the like a Palestinian farmer might live on one side of the wall. Mm. The wall goes through and cuts off the farmer from. We've his, visited uh, both, uh, witnessed that, it's, and watched that happen. It's happening. just outrageous. Craig um, talks about this a lot and shows a photo of how that's done, where the wall is placed right up against a village because the farmers in Palestine live in their villages and go out to their farmland. So when you put the wall right next to the village, uh -huh. you you keep the population of Palestine isolated, uh -huh. uh, and you but you take the land uh, where also a lot of the water resources happen to be. Okay. Um, we, uh, we're running quite tight on time. I want to uh, give people a chance to, to uh, uh, connect with, the, the, again, the websites of these organizations, right. uh, the Olympia Rafa Sister City Project, uh, website www.orscp.org, and the Rachel Corey Foundation for Peace and Justice. Uh, the phone is 754-3998, and the website is www.rachelcoreyfoundation.org. Um, one of the things that we had hoped to talk about that we were getting squeezed on mm -hmm. for time um, it is just the power of the arts to express realities. Mm -hmm. And we both have, you know, you've both talked about that some. Um, and we think about like the you had mentioned the, the mural in Centralia about the wobblies right. that's been so encouraging. Right. And you had mentioned that, that your first connection with Rachel was about the arts. Mm -hmm. uh, and you connected and what your project that, that Yeah, she did. and I together, yeah, um, started the doves in the procession of the species. And people just love the doves in the procession of the species. So <laughs> I want to thank, thank you for that. And uh, so that's another connection that, that really gives life to the community. Um, uh, let's see. You've got, we've mentioned a couple of the upcoming things. Oh, you have something there. You want to do a well, quick, we're really tight on time, so if do I, the quotation. I, I just we'll, wanted to share a quote with, from Rachel that refers to the Centralia mural, yes, yes, uh, which was, was an inspiration. And she wrote, I am still struck by the Centralia mural project and the whole idea of visual reminders of repressed history. And I am thinking about how we don't have this in Olympia. Reading Logtown, I found the name of the squiaddle of Ald Inlet, the sketches of Bud Inlet. I'm quite sure I have never heard the name squiaddle before. I knew about Squack, Squaxin and Nisqually. I, want, I went to a relatively progressive elementary school and we had speakers from the tribes and ate traditional food and built popsicle stick longhouses. But I grew up in Ald Inlet, literally in it. If you ask me where I grew up, in the inlet, in the creek, in the mud, amongst the salmon. And did I hear that name at any point, Squiaddle? I need to know whose creek that is. You know, we don't have that. We have a lot of murals of whales, and that's fine. Whales are just fine. We are into the environment here. It's an accessory. A lot of people feel very connected to the environment as something that is especially ours. So we have whale murals. There's a big difference between whale murals and the mural in Centralia. Content, yes, but also just the catalyzing nature of that mural in Centralia. Acknowledgments of repression, acknowledgment of conflicted histories. Whale murals are pretty benign. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. Okay. So this mural project that you're planning for uh, downtown Olympia and in, in Rafa, uh, very powerful and will give uh, voice to a lot of a lot of people. Uh, uh, I wonder if we can get like a very brief 
closing thought from each of you and then we'll wrap this thing up yeah i i think you know I, this quote i shared because i think for a lot of people it's still hard for us to see as i said the occupation what that means for palestinian people but there are a lot of people connected to this issue in a lot of ways and i think through art we can bring people together to talk about that and to recognize our responsibility here and to see what we can do to take steps hopefully towards a, a solution, a better time. And I just want to encourage people to get involved, that there's so many ways to get involved in the mural. Um, from We hope to have a huge uh, unveiling celebration at the end, so we need folks to help plan that and envision that. And you know, artists, there's still plenty of room for people to get involved in the design and That's will great. be throughout the next few months. So, yeah. That's great. I want to thank both of you for the work <laughs> that you're doing and all the other people involved with this uh, that are working on this. Thanks for being guests on the program. And we want to thank the folks who've been watching for having watched during this hour. Uh, we have more information about the Olympia Rafa Sister City Project and the Rachel Corey Foundation for Peace and Justice. Their websites are uh, available on the screen. Uh, the Rachel Corey Foundation office in Olympia is 754-3998. For information about these and a variety of issues, you can contact the Olympia Fellowship of Reconciliation at 4919093. The news media in our country really don't do a very good job of conveying the kinds of realities that Rochelle and Cindy have uh, conveyed to us now. I encourage people to seek out alternative sources of information beyond the mainstream. We're all one human family and we all share one planet. We can make the world a better place, but we all have to do our part. And the world needs what you have to offer. Thanks for watching.